Welcome, welcome, welcome to a brand new episode of A Danny Talk for Educators Live, the show for the unsung heroes of education. I'm your host, Kwame Safa Mensa. If this is your first time tuning in to the podcast, we welcome you and we hope that you return for some more episodes. If you're a returning audience member or listener, we welcome you back for this new episode. Uh, but before we get to our guest for tonight, I want to just make a few announcements. As you already know, we have our Danny Talk Apparel Shop that is open in the Teespring store. We have some new designs out for 2021 for our librarians, for our principals. So we're trying to expand with the line and include a lot of the other education professionals that make a difference in our schools. So make sure you check us out at the Teespring store at teesprings.com backslash stores backslash the identity talk apparel shop. So check this out. And then finally, if you are an educator, whether you're in the state of Massachusetts or you're anywhere in the world and you're looking for some professional development credits and some content around culture responsive teaching, anti-racist practices, family engagement, parent engagement, lesson planning, time management, and just overall trying to shape your teacher identity. We have our Shape of the Teacher Identity 101 program now on Teachable. So make sure that you book a call with us today at Conley.com backslash identity talk numeral four educators. So make sure you reach out to us if you're looking for some content and some professional development points towards your license. All right. Now let's get to the main event. So tonight we're talking about black identity development and how it manifests itself in a predominantly white school or educational setting. So tonight's guest is someone who is doing some extensive research on this very issue, which I feel is very important for us to amplify. And she's currently an adjunct professor uh, she's an educator, and she is doing her doctoral work at Northeastern University here in Boston, Massachusetts. So I am honored to have Rachel Delavaux come on to the show to talk to us about her research and just her work overall. So let's go ahead and bring her on. How hey. you doing, Rachel? Good, good. Very happy to be here. Thank you so much for having me. No, well, thank you for coming on. You're talking about something that's very important, and I just needed to have you on to really do a deep dive on this. But uh, before we get into the main substance of our conversation, I'd like to ask our guest, what first brought you to education? And then also just tell us a little bit about your upbringing overall. Yeah, so my my dance with education has been very interesting. <laughs> um, anyone who knows me knows that growing up, I really did not like school. Um, you know, I felt very invisible. You know, I grew up in Cambridge, went to Cambridge Public Schools my whole life. And, um, you know, I, I wasn't a bad child because I came from a strict uh, Caribbean household. Um, but I wasn't someone who excelled academically. My teachers would often write on my report cards, uh, Rachel is bright and has a lot of potential, um, and but doesn't live up to her capabilities. And I remember thinking as a child, wow, they think I'm smart. Um, as an educator, now I think, wow, they did me such a huge disservice because learning is a skill, <laughs> you know, and their job was to take my raw potential and help me to learn to actualize it. Um, and so I really didn't find my voice until uh, maybe my junior year in college, um, which then catapulted me on this path to education, but more from kind of like a, I don't really want anyone, any child to experience what I went through. So I got my start teaching uh, in Boston public schools, um, realized that I couldn't really be effective in, in making change beyond my classroom. And so I pursued my master's in education administration, which then led me on this journey of you know, more administrative roles while still fulfilling my passion to teach um, part-time as an adjunct. And so here we are. <laughs> All right. 
and you mentioned during your junior year of college that you found your voice. Was there a particular moment during that year that propelled you into what you're doing today? Yeah, I, I remember um, I remember vividly because I, I really struggled undergrad. Um, I share in full transparency. I was uh, academically recessed. That's what that that's the proper word that they call it now. <laughs> oh, wow. but back but back then it was you got kicked out. <laughs> and I got I got kicked out of UMass Amherst because I was not academically performing. And I remember I had to go through a whole process of uh, coming back after a year. And um, it was a dean. Uh, his name was Dean Pioli from Somerville um, and his wife, uh, Dr. Elizabeth Petroff, who really invested in me and helped me to understand you know, um, some of the things that were happening to me as a student of color were were things that were not my fault and help me to kind of be aware of that because I remember being on this journey thinking a lot of this was like my fault, but I was never really taught how to learn, <laughs> you know? Um, and he gave, he equipped me with the tools to be able to advocate for myself and advocate for what I need. I think as a consequence of, you know, being invisible growing up academically, um, I was never taught how to speak up, <laughs> you know, and say, I need this, or, you know, um, this shouldn't be happening, or no, you're wrong, you know, and so my junior year was pivotal, um, you know, thanks to Dean Pioli and his wife, Dr. Dr. Petroff, that really gave me, gave me the tools to, to overcome that adversity and win. Wow, and what's amazing about this is, so often we tell our students to develop their own sense of agency around content and different things that they're learning, but yet we don't always model how to build agency. Mm -hmm. It's like this buzzword that we just throw out there in our education circles, but we don't always do the best job in, in demonstrating what that looks like and what that sounds like as well, because there's also a verbal component to that um, in terms of advocacy. Yeah. And it's particularly important for for black children, you know, especially, you know, given that oftentimes they're left out of conversations, you know. And so when we think about power, how do we expect them to take it and own it when oftentimes they don't see it? You know, so I think there has to be a higher level of intentionality around, you know, not just telling them, but showing them what that looks like and then giving them opportunities to 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 test it out, <laughs> you know, in a, in a space that is safe so that they can hone it. So when they leave our doors, uh, they, they can really take those skills into to the larger world. Right. So I know you said earlier that you did your K-12 school in Cambridge. And for those who aren't familiar with Cambridge, Massachusetts, we know it's a college town. So, you know, you have your Harvard, your MITs of the world and and then even nearby, you have Boston University and a lot of other universities. But in terms of Cambridge Public Schools, what was the demographic makeup as far as student body and even with faculty? Yeah, so student body, I remember vividly, it was 60-40 split. So 60% uh, students of color. So that could be African-Americans or it could be, you know, um, anyone from the African diaspora or Caribbean, you know, um, we, we represented in terms of student population. However, it was the inverse when you think about like leadership and teachers, you know, um, during that time, K through 12, I want to say I only had two, <laughs> you know, two um, uh, teachers that were, that were not white, you know, um, and, and that's huge. <laughs> you know, I remember being in uh, elementary school uh, in first grade and the, um, my earliest memory of first grade is um, hearing over the intercom every day, uh, teachers, please turn in your racial figures. <laughs> so if that, gives, yes. <laughs> so if that gives you any context <laughs> of what, you know, what my educational experience was in terms of like, you know, best practices around DEI, <laughs> right? Um, there you have it. Wait, that, wait, that's crazy. You, you said they made 
an announcement saying, hey, teachers, turn in your racial figures. Yeah. What? Hey. Every day. And, well, that's just another way to let you know, hey, you are a guest in this school. Right? Right. <laughs> that's just, wow. That's, mm -hmm. that's unbelievable. But I think this is a perfect segue uh, because I know you're doing a lot of research currently at Northeastern regarding black identity develop in predominantly white uh, settings, but I know you have a specific definition um, for predominantly white settings and not what people may perceive that to be. So if you could just explain what you mean by predominantly white settings, just so that the audience can have a, some clarification around that. Right. And so what we know is that there is a ton of research out there that talks about how um, school leaders and school administrators, you know, are responsible um, largely for academic uh, achievement outcomes and um, culture setting. Right. And so I am defining um, white school culture not based on student population, but based on the teachers and administration demographics. And so um, white school culture um, defined as um, having white leaders and teachers for uh, primarily. All right. And thank you for that clarification. And I think that's an experience that many of us have gone through. I know for myself as a student, I mean, I went to predominantly white high school. So I know a little bit about just the dominant white culture and how it manifests itself um, in that setting. Um, and then even as a teacher in BPS, I mean, I worked in a school where majority of the faculty was white. Mm -hmm. And me being a black educator, I was an anomaly. So, so I know a little bit about that. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, no, no, I'm, I'm, I get it. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's it's crazy. But just based on what you've been able to research, in what ways do the cultural dynamic of this predominantly white school culture um, impact Black identity development? Because I think that's really the crux of what we really need to amplify. Yeah, so um, I want to give the context that I am still in deep and deeply embedded in this research. So I can share to this point um, and give the context that there may even be more because um, data is still coming in. Um, so three primary ways right now, socially, emotionally, and institutionally, right? And so um, my research is mixed method. So it, it consists of qualitative and quantitative data. Um, so um, for the qualitative side, I have um, done focus groups and interviews with children starting at the ages of eight, um, going to the ages of uh, 17. And then my quantitative data um, starts at the age of 18. <laughs> and then it just goes, <laughs> you know, goes as old as, uh, I think the oldest person that took my, my survey this far, thus far is in their 80s, you know? And so um, what, what I've seen consistently are these three buckets, um, you know, how these experiences made them feel clarity and what the experiences were, and then also the systemic, <laughs> the systemic um, things, or be it policies, practices in place that then reinforced it. So essentially, um, students are being reinforced, the students are getting reinforcement in those three ways <laughs> that they are inferior, um, that their, their identity development is not important, um, it's being reinforced, uh, you know, through these inequitable policies, um, you know, where they're being penalized at, you know, for, you know, harsher consequences, um, for same things as their white counterparts. Um, and then the long-term effects of that in terms of them not feeling like they are as smart, um, are not as deserving, um, feeling silenced, muted, 
Um, you know, and then when we look at like when we traject these out, you know, low self-efficacy, which is a key indicator of imposter syndrome. Um, and that's for me how all of this work even started, you know, um, my working with college students and finding in large numbers that they were suffering with imposter syndromes and, and me wanting to get to the root of what was causing it. <laughs> um, and then unpacking, wow, <laughs> we're basically, we have a full engine going here with a system that is pumping out <laughs> students with imposter syndrome. You know what I mean? Um, right. So, <laughs> it, it's wild. Like, you know, um, children are at, at a very early age learning to divorce their identity from their academic performance, you know, um, so much so that in my data from the adults, um, they didn't even realize <laughs> that that had happened, you know? So like um, case in point, there was one, one question on my survey that asked, well, um, you know, do you believe how you were treated um, were, were you treated the same way as your white counterpart? And I want to say 95% of Black participants across all age groups um, said, yes, they were, <laughs> right? However, when you, um, uh, you get down to the policies, do you believe that the policies were, um, you know, unbiased, you know, towards Black students mm. across the board? they believe that they were, right? When we get to um, like self-image and self-efficacy, do you believe that how you were treated impacted your, your ability to um, positively <laughs> do, do you believe how you tr were tr treated uh, impacted you in a positive way in your ability to successfully complete your your academic assignments and tasks. Yes, they agreed with that in large numbers, right? <laughs> but then when we get to this academic piece, right? Mm -hmm. It's the inverse <laughs> of, do you believe that, um, I basically asked the same question, but leading with academics and leaving race as a factor out of it, they they said that they, it had no bearing on their ability to do their work, right? Wow. So, as, <laughs> so when I'm looking at this data as an analyst, right, we start to think about, well, what are some, what may be the reason for this disconnect, <laughs> you know? And one of the things that I am proposing is this divorcing of identity <laughs> from academics early, you know, um, and, and so early that we're not even aware of it, even when we talk about, talk about it in context of like buzzwords, like double consciousness, mm. <laughs> you know? And so I think that like when it, when it comes to trying to address this, you know, moving forward, there's so much that needs to be done to, to include it in, in, into the curriculum, into the policies, systems, cultures, all of that. We can't talk about it in terms of culturally responsive pedagogy because being responsive is not enough. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know? you're right. Yeah. And there are a couple of things that just popped in my mind as you were talking. I think the reason why, why the disconnect happens is because we think about the way our K-12 system is structured in America, it's already embedded in whiteness. So when you come into it, you're not conscious of that fact. You're just going to school. You're not thinking, oh, I'm going to a school that has maybe white supremacist um, norms and, and is embedded in white privilege and all kinds of things. We're not thinking it along those terms. We're just going to school because we have parents who are telling us, go to school, get good grades. Especially if you come from Caribbean culture, and in my case, you know, West African culture, mm -hmm. it's all about education. Absolutely, they're not. They're not. They're not worried about, you know, the other aspects of it that we're talking about today. Absolutely. Um, here's the thing, and you know, because my my family too, you know, Caribbean roots, and here's the thing: 
when you go to the school, when you go to school in the Caribbean, right? The difference is that the teachers look like you, <laughs> you know? Yep. So it's not just that you're 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 finding like you know comfort in students who look like you, but it's the teachers, you know, it's the teachers, it's the principals, you know, all of the administrators, and so that culture <laughs> supports you. <laughs> so now there's certain things that you don't have that that are not needed to be topics of conversation, right? Like we don't have to talk about you know, black identity development in the Caribbean, because it is, <laughs> you know, now we can focus on the rigor of education, you know what I mean? And so when, when my, when my, my father came over here, you know, from Jamaica, you know, for him, he understood the rigor of education and, you know, he completely gets what's, what's going on in, in the school systems, having worked in, in American public school systems and sees the disconnect between, okay, this is not inherently baked into American school systems. You know, I think HBCUs do a good job at that, you know, um, and, and, you know, schools that are mission driven to do that, you know. Um, however, largely in part, that's not a part of any school culture. And so it, it's, it's left out, it's missing, and then children are still expected to rise to the occasion in, the rela in, in relation to like academic rigor in, in, in achieving high success. All right. I have a crazy question. And maybe you've already looked into it in your research. What if the Black student comes from a strong pan-Africanist family that pretty much instills a self-efficacy self in that child? They make them feel good about who they are. Um, does that in a way, mitigate the divorcing that happens in academics when you come from a family that pretty much instills that cultural uh, pride and that self-worth in you. Because you have some students who look like you and I who grew up in these predominantly white settings and it's to a point where they're fully assimilated and they almost are like the people they go to school with, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, and, and you're right. <laughs> and so yes, to your point, it does mitigate it. You know, um, on the flip side of it, there is that, I think the, the other part is that there is a disconnect between, you know, students who didn't <laughs> um, get that at home you know, and don't have that same level of like self-efficacy reinforcement or identity development at home. And so it's like, well, you know, my my family did this for me. How come your family doesn't do it for you? And then it kind of creates this inter-ethnic divide um, sometimes, not always, <laughs> not always. I've come across um, people who can hold both. Like, yes, I recognize the the privilege that I got in my family giving me this, equipping me with this to go into this school to be able to withstand this and achieve this, right? So I think there's both, absolutely. Right, and I think that just reinforces, you know, the double consciousness, because I know for me, being Ghanaian and an American, I had to deal with that as an elementary school student, you know, where the Black students, you know, my peers, they didn't really fully accept me because I had a fully African name. So I was teased for, for that. It wasn't even the white students, it was like black students. Mm -hmm. My skin mm -hmm. folk. But then we look at the, my American side of my identity, that wasn't really that wasn't really something that was accepted neither. Because of the fact that both my parents came from Ghana. They were both immigrants, making me a first generation immigrant. So that's what I had to navigate at such a young age. And when you're six through nine years old, you don't really know how to, like how to embrace that and, and really negotiate what's going on. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, it, it is, uh, there's so much happening for children, <laughs> you know? So there's this like Maslow's, right, hierarchy 
need and, and particularly for young for young children, uh, sense of belonging, right? So there's that yeah. piece going on. But then if you look at crosses and Finney's, you know, she, she calls it ethnic identity development. I believe Cross calls it black identity development. This idea that for young black children, it, initially they're accepting the mainstream culture, <laughs> right? And so, you know, you what that basically means is, you know, if if they're not learning their their um, identity and their you know their black identity early, they're accepting the mainstream culture. So even though they look like you and I they're saying things that are inconsistent with that, you know? So right. to your story, you know, we're, we're making fun of things, <laughs> you know what I mean? Where, you know, um, I remember growing up in, um, you know, my, my family is Jamaican and Bahamian. And so like, we'd have curry, curry goat <laughs> for Thanksgiving. And I remember, you know, in, in elementary school saying that, like, you know, well, I, I never ate it only because I have my own little traumatic story around it. <laughs> um, I would share, like, yeah, the, these things were on our Thanksgiving table and being made fun of, oh, your family eats goat, you know, kind of thing. Um, but again, that 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 piece, that that identity piece, like if if the, if we're not being taught that early on and that that's OK. So I remember, you know, for growing up not wanting to share that because I was socialized in school to believe that that was an embarrassing thing, you know? Right. And when you're talking about uh, black identity development, I'm pretty sure that special education has to factor into it, given the racial disproportionality that exists in so many of these settings. Um, and just speaking as a, a former IEP student, I've witnessed this firsthand. So I just wanted to know if, if you know, within your research, you've been able to come across anything regarding special education as it pertains to black students in these settings and how it factors into, you know, the self-efficacy piece and, and all the other aspects that you're covering. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, and something now that I'm kind of like, hmm, I got to look more into that. So not specifically, like my research focuses just generally on showing the through line and how early, you know, children are, are, are separated from their Black identity development. Um, but I do think it is worth taking a, a look at, you know, just looking at the data I've collected. I think the question that I'm flagging is how much more... <laughs> are students who are, you know, classified as, as needing special education impacted by this. You know what I mean? Because it is, it, it's almost kind of like a, a, a double jeopardy, if you will. So you're already being marginalized, you know, as a student of color, but then you're marginalized again because of special education. But, you know, then do you really need special education or is it a lack of understanding around your cultural needs? And, and lack of support to su provide that. No, um, absolutely. And I just figured that it was something worth mentioning because you mentioned the institutional piece of it. Mm -hmm. And we think about the way black students in general are referred to special education programs. I mean, you can't really escape that. It's something that has to warrant some type of conversation. So I just figure I just um, shared that out. Yeah, I wrote it down. <laughs> <laughs> okay. to, look more in, to look more into it because that is, it, it is a great question. It's a great observation. And um, you saying that made me think of um, even in Cambridge, like, you know, um, they used to have like, we it was like five schools in one essentially. Um, and there was one particular school that I felt like students who were, you know, um, who came from other countries, like uh, whether it be first gen or just came to, to this country were put in this one school, one particular school. And it was so, like, you know, like it, it, it was so marginalizing, you know, and, and it was blatant. You know, I remember even being a student thinking, wow. Like all, all of um, the students who are, were non-Black American <laughs> were, were 
basically put in this one school, <laughs> you know, and why, you know, um, it, you know, I, I couldn't really understand it, but I also didn't really have any power to challenge it either. Right. So, so you mentioned after school programs. So we've talked about what goes on during school hours with black identity <laughs> development, but then you're saying that after school programs can actually help to alleviate this burden that's placed on black students. So I do want to give you a chance to share with us what significant role after school programs can play in helping black students build self-efficacy, but also navigate those challenges that they may experience within those school settings. Right. And so um, thank you for asking that question because it is a sub question within my research, how after school programs or extracurricular activities can serve as an intermediary for self-efficacy development, because that is the, that is the piece that, you know, that comes from identity development, the self-efficacy, right? And that's the critical part. You know, it's important to know who you are so that you can know what you're capable of, <laughs> right? Um, because that is going to be key in, in where you where you end up. And so after school programs are are uniquely positioned in a way that schools are not to be able to support the identity development, which then lends to building self-efficacy because they're children are seen as stakeholders, <laughs> you know? And so when it comes to like more challenging pieces like curriculum, it's not the same level of hesitancy there to try these, you know, to try these things on because it's not the fear of rejection. It's not the fear of judgment. It's not the, you know, the insecurity. This is what's coming out of my research. Children are saying, you know, I'm more inclined to try STEM STEM related things in an after school program more than trying it in school because I know that the the staff at the program are not going to judge me if I make a mistake, you know, I'm not going to feel ostracized. I can, you know, I feel free to be able to just do the work. I don't feel like the policies at the after school are are biased towards me because of my race, you know. So these are the these are the unique things about the after school program. It's inherently designed to be student centered, and to see students as stakeholders, which is why I believe, you know, um, it it can be critical um, as an intermediary for self efficacy development. And this circles right back to what we said about agency, right? Mm -hmm. How we always tell students that they need to take ownership of their learning, ownership of their academics, but we are in a space that doesn't even affirm who you are. How can you possibly take ownership of what you're learning when you're distracted by, by that instant, right? So I, so I do feel like we think about after school programs, it's a sanctuary. It, it provides you with joy. And when you think about self-efficacy, I think black joy, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And that's something that we need we need that force of, especially now. So I'm so glad you're you're covering the after school program piece because a lot of people have had their lives saved because of after school programs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just have a push to after school programs only because like, you know because they are so pivotal in, in self-efficacy development for, for black children. Um, I eventually say children in general, but you know, since my research is focused primarily on black children, you know, um, how we word our mission <laughs> is so important. I do believe that um, after school programming is like a good vehicle, but it is not the only vehicle. And right. there, some after school programs that are mission driven. And I don't like the language around saying that, you know, without this, children will be in the street. <laughs> you know, I, I don't like that. I, I really don't, because I think we need to have more faith in our in our children, particularly our black children, that, you know, they they will end up where they're supposed to be. And this is just a vehicle to get them there, but not the only vehicle, you know. Um, that, that's my only little side push <laughs> as it relates to after school programs, because I, I do, you know, there are, there are some um, 
nonprofit franchises after school programs that still do great work, but the way it's marketed, they talk about um, youth being at risk. And I think that if we're really about that change, we really need to change the, the way we're, we're marketing that so that we're not using that type of language. No, absolutely. So, and right there, we're talking about just how they tokenize, you know, black youth. Mm-hmm. And, and it almost, it pretty much has a, a saviorism tone to it as well. The way they market it, which is what's yeah. problematic. Whether mm-hmm. it's intended or not, it, it's mm-hmm. still problematic. So yeah. I definitely agree with that. Charter schools do it too, and I don't like it. <laughs> just don't like that language. Oh, know. that's another story for <laughs> we are um, not. We're not going to open up that can of worms. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but um, I do want to ask this question because, as you already know, um, my wife, she's a former, she's a MECO graduate. So she's experienced a lot of the things that we've already discussed throughout this episode. I've been at a predominantly white school. I know what my experiences were. But what I want to know is what role does, what are the pros and cons of school integration programs like, you know, locally MECO? So we know what MECO is and we know how it's had an impact on a lot of students who have gone through the program. Good, but there are some other things as well. Um, Do you feel like these programs can do more or are already doing enough to center black identity development? Because I know they they do a lot of work, a lot of great work, but can they possibly do more than what they're already doing? Yeah. Um, I think at its origins, well-intended, you know, however, I find it a bit problematic that in 2021, we are essentially in the same place that we were when the program started. You know, um, that's how I feel. <laughs> you know, I I think that there are many pros, but I think one of the biggest questions that I'm raising is how come f- for, for every one of those pros, how come it couldn't happen in 2021 or to, uh, you know, 2020, 2019, 2018, or anywhere after 2000s, how come it couldn't happen in the city that the children are from? And um, are we really helping, you know, with black identity development when it's not a school wide initiative? It's more of an affinity group kind of thing. You know, um, so it's kind of like we we recognize this is important. So we're going to, you know, have something for <laughs> for the black children. One of my biggest pushes as a student at Northeastern University, anytime there is language or conversation around that, my push is, yeah, but the children aren't the problem. It's the it's the teachers, it's the schools, it's the administration, it's the policies. So why is there not a larger push to reform that type of thinking. <laughs> you know, why is it only special support for the students, but the students are the problem? Um, so yeah, I, I don't know if I completely answered all of your question, but I just find it a bit problematic that if you look at the origin and when it started and now there's not much that's changed. Um, it, and then the second piece of it is, you know, at w- when does the lens change from, you know, putting provisions and support in place for black students, which represents the smaller population, then transforming how we understand diversity at large for the teachers, administrators, and white counterpart students that need to understand the work more deeply. Does that make sense? No, no, it does. And I think it's, it's, complicated because we were just talking about just how some of the nonprofit after school programs, you know, how they market uh, the work that they're doing. And I hate to do this because I do believe that Metal does a lot of great work, but I also feel like there is that saviorism tone as well with that because you have a lot of parents who are 
rushing to put their children on the wait list as soon as they're born. As -hmm. soon as they come out of the womb. Like, I know that was the case with my wife. Like, my mother and father-in-law put her on the list when she was maybe two or three years old, right? Before she could start kindergarten because it's so competitive. Well, because it's real, right? Like, you know, I can speak to this as a parent. You know, oftentimes I am forced to choose between academic rigor and uh, identity development, you know? And um, my son started out in a, a public school, you know, and uh, he, he's been going to school since he was two. And when he went in to the public school, my son knew how he was starting to read, you know, and he regressed significantly and he was ostracized because he's always on the younger side of um, his age group. And, you know, he was so eager to go to school and within a year he was begging me not to go. <laughs> you know, and so I, I just looked at it from from, you know, a systemic perspective, like what is happening here? And I went in to observe, you know, I'm, I'm one of those call it a helicopter parent, call it an educator parent, whatever. I was up in it and I was devastated by what I saw. And so I immediately pulled my son out of there. Well, now he's in a Montessori school. Right. And so he now is more ambivalent about going to school. He doesn't wake up saying, hey, you know, I don't want to go, right? He has his group of friends. However, I realize he, what he needs now is to see more people, more leaders, more teachers that look like him. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's it's not just about, it's not just about the, the academic rigor because we do know that that is a key indicator in success and where students end up. In, in the high expectations, we know those are key indicators, but this identity development piece is huge, <laughs> you know? And so my son is at that age where he needs to see, um, he needs to see and be in a culture where teachers and administrators look like him so that it reinforces this culture to him socially, emotionally, and institutionally that he belongs and he can do the work. And that's all has to happen. And I think we talk about academic rigor versus black identity, right? Mm-hmm. How you're able to choose between the two if you're put in that position. This is where the parent has to play a significant role because if you come from a really strong household that pretty much supplements that black identity piece. Mm-hmm. You can go to pretty much any school and be all right because you're already getting that learning within the home. But we also know that there are some households where parents are going to, you know, put that knowledge into the heads of their children for whatever reasons or circumstances, um, no fault of their own. But we understand that there are different dynamics that come into play when you think about uh, the homes that the children are coming from. Absolutely. And I think there's levels to it, too. You know, like I, I often say I, I acknowledge my privilege, <laughs> you know, as a as an educator and, and being kind of behind the scenes. So like I, I see the interworkings that a lot of parents that are not in education see. Right. And so I am positioned to equip my son in that way. On the flip side of that, you know, I feel like even though I am able to, and I do, right? You know, not just around his black identity development, but the politics of school (laughs) and things that he should know. Um, There's a part of me as a parent that doesn't want my son to have to be subjected to that. (laughs) If I'm being honest. Oh, of course. All right. (laughs) You know, Um, and, and, and that's very real too. Like, especially, especially for, for black boys when there's so much that they're going to have to deal with in, in society outside of school, you know? Um, and so I, I think, I think about that a lot, you know? Um, but you're absolutely right. Like, you know, it is crucial for parents to be having these conversations about who they are, where they come from, with their children at home. You know, um, my I take my son to the African American Museum ever since it opened. We go every year. You know, with COVID, obviously we we weren't able to go, but I take him every year. We have these conversations because it is important for him to understand 
where he comes from, who he is, <laughs> you know, and also how the world sometimes will try to not acknowledge who he is, you know, and he's great anyway, <laughs> you know, um, so it really, really is important. Yes. All right. I have one more question before we get to the lightning round. And I know you are in the process of launching your own firm. Yes. Uh, Bo Initiatives, right? So I wanted to give you a chance to just talk to us a little bit about the vision of the firm and what are some of the services that uh, the firm will provide uh, for parents, educators, and, and those who are involved? Yeah. So <laughs> when I first um, envisioned Vo Initiative, it was really to be what I call a gap filler, <laughs> you know, to provide, you know, um, children's support, right? to help them to build their self-efficacy, you know, providing skill sets, not necessarily academic content, but skill sets, providing, equipping parents with knowledge, information, and resources, you know, so that they can support, you know, their children outside of school, because I think that's really important. I will say that as my research has progressed, I realized that there is so much more that needs to be done beyond anything that I can offer a child or a parent and so there is this piece now where I am um, working with educational institutions to help them to transform their policies and practices to better support um, students. So um, that's the mission now, you know, to, to work. My vision is to expand that, um, not just in terms of working with schools, because I feel like I can only be as effective um, as the reach that I have to be able to do that. And so looking to partner with other organizations around doing that, because I do not believe that this work should be done in silo. Otherwise, it will take longer for, for change to happen. Yes. And it'll be great when it finally launches, because I know it's still in the developmental stages right now. Mm -hmm. So definitely have to keep us posted on that. But now we are going to lightning round. So we have a few questions we want to ask you mm -hmm. to get to know you a little bit better. Okay. So uh, first question I want to ask is with all the work that you're doing, the doctoral work and even the work that you're doing uh, with building this firm, how do you do self-care? What's your favorite self-care activity right now? <sighs> Massages. Massages. Like... I think that um, we don't realize how much of a filter our body is and, and what it takes in. <laughs> um, and, you know, we, I think we're good with the, with understanding like when it's time to eat, <laughs> sometimes when it's time to sleep, but like not necessarily how the stresses of what we do impact our, our physical well being. And so um, I regularly schedule massages because um, I, it's important to just, be able to relax, <laughs> um, get the get the stress out of the muscles and, and flush it out in a very real way. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, massages are awesome. And you don't realize how tense some of your body parts are when you do a massage, like the knots and, and all those other areas of tension. Like you don't really realize it when you're on the move, but then when you're lying down in there, putting the work in, Yes. Oh, you feel it. <laughs> you feel yeah. it. I had a solid month where I looked like I was shrugging, <laughs> you know, the whole time because I tend to carry my stress literally on my shoulders. Mm. So um, if I'm not careful, I, I can look like I'm doing this all the time. And so um, I regularly get massages. It's just so important. Yes. Uh, one book that you're currently reading. If you're reading anything. Yeah. Well, I'm reading a ton of books. <laughs> well, any, any books for leisure. Yeah. So um, my mentor slash professor slash dissertation chair, I absolutely love. In my program, one of the beauties of it is um, I had the privilege of meeting my dissertation chair my first year in. And so we've been able to build this amazing relationship. Dr. Wendy Crocker is phenomenal. And so um, she gave me this book, um, Start With The Why. And this is very, very, 
very helpful um, to me. And so I, I read it, I reference it a lot. It centers me because this work can be overwhelming at times, you know, and just always keeping that at my core, like, well, why am I doing this, you know, has really been able to help me to like push through. Awesome. Awesome. Um, if you can invite three influential figures that are alive to dinner, who would they be and why? So this gets me a little emotional. I had to write this down. Okay. <laughs> um, and so the first one, um, Michelle Obama, um, because I remember when, when President Obama was running for office, she was very reluctant to be in the limelight, but I, I want to invite her because she was able to reconcile, you know, what she personally preferred versus what she needed to do um, because of the the magnitude and the importance of it, and I and that, that resonates so much with me because I am inherently somebody who likes to be behind the scenes, <laughs> you know, uh, and it is much more easier for me to convey my brain trust to someone um, and help them to bring it to fruition than to be on the forefront of it myself. And I realize if I I really want it to be done the way in which I envision it, I need to be. I need to be out there. Like I was saying to you before, I can't lead the charge from behind, <laughs> from behind the scenes. And so um, I would invite her. The other person I wanted to invite is um, Martin Luther King Jr. Um, because I believe that he accomplished this thing, which I call a transcendence of thought, you know? And so mm. when he, um, you know, people remember a lot of like his speeches and things, um, and things that he did while he was alive. But right before he passed away, I had to look this up because I did not want to misquote this. He was quoted as saying, we have fought hard and long for integration as I believe we should have. And I know that we will win, but I've come to believe we're integrating into a burning house. Burning house. <laughs> I would love to have him at dinner to complete that, tra the, that transcendence of thought. You know, because I believe that right before he passed, there was this higher level of thinking that made him realize that there was there was actually more to this um, that maybe in hindsight wasn't accomplished, you know, or another direction that should have been taken that wasn't or, you know, and, and I would love to explore more about that. So that as we're thinking, like reimagining education, particularly for our black students, we get it right. <laughs> You know, yes. um, and so that's why I would want to invite him to dinner. The last person um, that I would want to invite to dinner, and this is where I had to write it down, um, my grandmother. You know, my grandmother, my maternal grandmother, Ida Delavo, who I dedicate everything that I'm doing to, um, no more than a third grade education, <laughs> you know, but best teacher I ever I've ever had, <laughs> you know, and there are so many questions now, um, given where I am in my, in my life that I would want to ask her, you know, like how, how like coming here with, with nobody, <laughs> you know, how, you know, well, I, I struggle thinking about, you know, I, I want to move to another state. How, how am I going to do that? <laughs> you know what I mean? And so to be able to ask her that, or just, you know, um, how did she, how did she uh, live off so little, but say, manage to save so much, <laughs> you know, or just the ability to love and have compassion for people who, you know, tr who judged her based on the melanin in her skin. I feel like these are skills that, you know, as I'm moving forward and progressing in my, in my own journey, these are things that I would love to have conversations with her about because nobody, nobody teaches that. You know what I mean? And she was able to master it at a time in the world where it was so difficult, you know, like it was what was happening during her time was so much more overt than what we're anything we're dealing with right now, you know, and she did it and she mastered it so beautifully. I would love to invite her to dinner and, you know, give her a hug and a kiss, tell her how much I miss her. Wow. Whew. <laughs> All right. All right. Whew. All right. Um, Last question. 
three words to describe your intentions for 2021. Mm -hmm. Expanding my territory. Boom. And there it is. Uh, Rachel, uh, thank you so much for taking the time to share your research with us and just your story. And we look forward to seeing how everything progresses from here on out. So thank you. Thank you for having me. And, and thank you for having this platform. You know, this, this is amazing. You know, you are you are giving voice to so many people and in and, and holding space to be able to, you know, share ideas and, you know, thinking. And I really appreciate that. And I just want to say thank you. Uh, no problem. But uh, before you step off, can you share with the viewers how they can follow you on social media? And most importantly, you do have a survey that you want some people to fill out. This would be a great time to just share a little bit about that and, how they can get in contact with you. Oh yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah. So I'm on Facebook. You can follow me. Uh, I try to keep it simple. My name, <laughs> Rachel Delavo um, on Instagram. It's I am Rachel Delavo. Um, I'm on LinkedIn as well. Rachel Delavo. And on any of those platforms, um, if you're interested in taking my surveys, I am looking particularly for people who identify as black um, and have attended predominantly white schools. And as I mentioned, the definition, how I'm defining it is if your uh, school administrators and teachers were predominantly white, um, I would love to, I would love to have you take part in my survey. Just send me a DM on any of those, um, any of those platforms and I will send it right over. All right, you all heard it. So if that sounds like you, if you fit that description, please hit up Rachel, fill out that survey, help a sister out. All right, Rachel. So thank you again, and we will connect soon. Looking forward to it. Thank you so much. All right. You take care. All right. Thanks, you too. And there you have it, folks. We are about to close out another episode of A Day Talk for Educators Live. And as I always say, until next time, we wish you a good night, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. And we're going to do this again another time. Peace out, people.